Tonix is a biotech company working to fight COVID-19 with two different next generation COVID vaccine candidates, an antiviral and also a treatment for long COVID. And with me is CEO Seth Letterman to explain where they are in this fight. And, and Seth, I look forward to your update because I know the last time we talked, you were working on a vaccine as well. So um, looks like you've got a broad uh, number of candidates here, broad, broad number of products to fight COVID. Can you bring me up to date on what you've got going? Thank you, Jane. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, we're working in a number of different ways on COVID because no one could have predicted how wily this virus could be, how much it's mutating, how much it's frustrating all of our efforts to evade it. Currently, there are three arms to the fight against COVID, the mRNA vaccines, the uh, antivirals, and the monoclonal antibodies. And what we're finding is that the existing mRNA vaccines have limited abilities. They have short duration of protection, only four to six months, and they don't block forward transmission. On the antivirals, really you have remdesivir from Gilead as being the anchor of the antiviral uh, treatment. And that's already uh, had some resistance strain documented against it. Um, the Pfizer drug is very interesting, but it's limited because it can, can't be taken by many people who are older on other medicines. And then finally, the monoclonal antibodies, there were four approved, and now two of them have uh, been shown not to work against Omicron, so they aren't working. So we're not in a good position right now as a country, as, a, as humanity, in terms of fighting COVID. So Tonics is proud to have many programs underway. We really think that by having more programs underway, we're able to take the expertise we have in animal models, in looking at the human immune response, and in understanding the virus itself to bring forth better candidates. Mm -hmm. So one of our um, vaccines is a um, live virus vaccine, TNX 1800, and we believe that will provide durable immunity, um, you know, for years, decades, maybe a lifetime, because it's in a live virus vaccine vector. We have an antiviral um, that has recently uh, been studied by NIAID, that's Dr. Tony Fauci's division, and shown to be 65 times more potent than remdesivir, and to work together with remdesivir in an additive way. And then also, um, long COVID, huge problem. About a third of people who recover from COVID get long COVID, and we have a treatment that we expect to be in clinical trials this half uh, to start to address long COVID. Is there efficiencies in working on all four of these, even though they're not exactly the same thing? Is there some overlap that helps with the development? Yes, and that's an excellent question. And that's why we, we are working on them, because we do feel that we can take the expertise in you know, large animal models, non-human primates, small animals, um, hamsters, mice, et cetera, and then um, also, you know, in tissue culture in the lab, uh, that all of those are uh, similarly used across the different modalities, and we have expertise in all three. Furthermore, um, you know, we're studying in, in two programs that we've publicly disclosed, CoveLogic and, and Precision, we're studying the human immune response to COVID. So uh, together, all of these things give us, I think, an advantage of seeing a bigger picture and in um, efficiently studying these different things. And also, as I think we spoke about last time, we have a approximately 40,000 square foot facility in Frederick, Maryland, that um, is dedicated completely to, you know, virus antiviral vaccine research. Frederick, Maryland is you know, right in the heart of the biotech corridor. And not only that, the biodefense and pandemic preparedness uh, corridor of um, Maryland. And you know, that's a very important uh, aspect in our ability to run these programs and really contribute to the fight against COVID. Mm -hmm. Now, the CDC, FDA, they've kind of changed their messaging lately on uh, COVID saying, you know, it's probably going to be endemic. We're all going to get it at some point. Does that change at all your strategy? Yes. Well, you know, I think that that was, a, an, you know, an important statement. There was a health committee meeting um, about two weeks ago. The Senate Health, Education, Labor and Pensions Committee uh, met and they interviewed um, FDA 
uh, NIH and uh, CDC. And yeah, that is the new messaging that this is endemic and uh, you know, more than one official said they expect everyone to get uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2 infected at some point. So I think that the, for us means that this is not something that's a, a one-year effort or, you know, it's going to come and go. This is something that we're going to have to deal with as humanity, basically, until the end of time. Our long-term goal is to tame it in such a way that, for example, MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, was tamed. That The MMR vaccine is three live virus vaccines. Uh, smallpox was eradicated. It was eradicated based on a live virus vaccine. So we're using in our vaccination strategy, the oldest technology. And you know we're doing it because we think we can provide long-term durable immunity. Mm-hmm. So I think that you know, while um, you know, the mRNA vaccines got us some breathing room mm-hmm. and we've had several warnings that COVID isn't going away, it's changing, it's keep coming at us with new challenges. Um, you know, I think that we really are going to be involved in this fight for you know a long time to come, and hopefully, Tonics can make uh, some it can put forward some solutions that would be enduring, and you know hope to you know get us back to some kind of you know pre-pandemic normalcy, which we are not in yet. No, I think you know. I think it's estimated that about eighty thousand Americans were killed by COVID just in the last wave with Omicron. Mm. So this is an unacceptable level of death, lockdowns, interruptions of the economy, and everything else. Yeah. It's, it's a serious problem, and it's, you know, it's not going away, might be getting worse. Well, and I hear a lot of talk about these mRNA vaccines, as you mentioned. I mean, they were amazing and did, I think, give us some breathing room, but they're leaky. Um, I mean, I know a lot of people who especially got the Omicron variant who were even boosted um, with vaccines. So it found its way around around that. So you've just um, reached a deal with Kansas State University on some mRNA research, right? So tell me about that. Yes. So your comments about mRNA vaccines, I absolutely agree with. I I personally have had three doses of the Pfizer vaccine. I advise anyone who's not vaccinated or isn't fully vaccinated to get vaccinated. But notwithstanding the huge impact it's had on the course of the pandemic, the mRNA vaccines are limited. There are three main ways that they're limited. First, short duration of protection, only four to six months. Second is they don't seem to block forward transmission, at least of Omicron and Delta. And third, they're very sensitive to increased temperature. They're unstable, and it makes shipping, transport, and actually just vaccinating people challenging. So this new technology from Kansas State is very exciting because it deals with the third one of those problems, the thermo stability, the ability to have mRNA vaccines that are stable at higher temperatures, a standard refrigerator, maybe even room temperature. So while the existing mRNA vaccines um, are mRNAs inside a bubble, it's like a soap bubble called the lipid nanoparticle, but the lipid is the bubble outside. And our technology that we've just um, optioned and we're developing in collaboration with Kansas State University is different because instead of having the mRNA on the inside, this is a a solid particle and the mRNA mRNA is really on the outside. So it's much more stable and can be transported it with standard refrigeration, possibly even at room temperature. So it really has the potential to address one of the major limitations. And this affects a global vaccine strategy. We've now learned that if we don't eradicate, well, we're not going to eradicate it, but if we don't control COVID around the globe, we're not going to be safe in the United States. Yeah. So countries like India, you know, parts of the continent of Africa, other parts of the world, don't have the refrigeration infrastructure necessary to deploy the existing mRNA vaccines. But potentially with our new technology, 
these mRNA vaccines or similar ones could be could be deployed around the world and keep us safe here as well as being deployed here. Well, that's fascinating. <laughs> the, the science and this constant kind of learning process that we're going through with all this. And I mean, I know people are kind of critical of it, but it's like, this is a new virus. I mean, we're learning kind of on the job, it feels like. So yeah, yeah. we're learning on the job and this virus <laughs> is keeping us on our toes. Mm -hmm. And you know, Omicron was the first, in my view, the, first, the second major serotype so I think it's a reasonable expectation that you know we you know just like in 2021 we may expect we may expect three major variants in 2022 and maybe new serotypes. There's already, as right. I'm sure you know, a new Omicron, Omicron uh, BA.2 yeah. that people think came from Denmark, but it's already in 30 states in the United States mm -hmm. and. It's going to be another problem. So we have a lot to learn, and I'm I'm so proud of our team to be in the fight. And um, it's but it, it is challenging. Well, I do want to ask you about the BA.2. I mean, is that an area of concern for you? It doesn't seem like people are freaking out quite as much as they did about Omicron. What do you think? Well, the good news, and it's still preliminary, and is according to the WHO, it seems to have approximately the same virulence as the first Omicron. Mm. So that's the good news in the sense that many younger people will get a relatively mild illness. Um, but remember, Omicron was not benign. As I said, it's, it's estimated that, you know, as many as 80,000 Americans have died from Omicron. So that's not a benign or acceptable level. But the very concerning thing about Omicron is in addition to the 32 mutations that Omicron had, this one already has 28 new mutations on top of those. And they're not only restricted to the spike protein, which is the, the outer protein, but they're also in some key proteins inside the virus. So this is a real warning signal. It is really something that should keep us on alert mm. and make us recognize that we need more tools to fight COVID and we need them really quickly. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Letterman, uh, for explaining that and um, good luck on your efforts. And um, it's a fight I think we're going to be fighting for quite some time. Thank you, Jane. Thanks.